Galatians chapter 1. In my last Sunday school lesson, we began our study of the epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Galatians uh, with an overview of the epistle and an outline toward the end of that. We looked at the province of Galatia uh, and the social condition in which the Galatians live in these various churches to which the Apostle Paul was writing. And we saw what happened during the Apostle Paul's first and second missionary journeys through Galatia's major cities of Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. And we saw the purpose of his epistle was to warn the Galatians of a dangerous false doctrine, a soteriological doctrine of a works-based gospel, which at that time was in the form of uh, requiring obedience to Mosaic law and being circumcised and, ob and observing feast days that were in the Mosaic law, but it's in other forms today. This false works-based gospel also threatens our churches today. And then we briefly looked at my five-point outline, uh, which we will be following in our study through the epistle. So today we're going to begin our study with the first point of, of my outline, which is the greeting, the introduction, that covers verses 1 through 10. The title of the lesson today is the right authority. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3 today, in which we're going to see the Apostle Paul's introduction of himself as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I have four main points in my lesson today. I want to make some important observations from the text uh, here in verses 1 through 3. Let's go ahead and read it before we pray. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be unto you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to be looking at these three verses today. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have to spend your word to understand it further and to understand its application and its implications. We ask that you will be pleased with our response to the hearing of your word. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And so my first point is I want to look at the brethren. I want to look at the brethren. In verse 2, he says, And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. The brethren whom he's with and the brethren to whom he's writing. Uh, as I mentioned in my introduction to the epistle in my last lesson, it was written to the churches throughout Galatia that Paul the apostle started and established. And the churches in this region had a strong influence from Judaizers who were claiming to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but who also taught that these church members had to keep parts of the Mosaic law in order to become righteous in God's eyes, or in order to remain righteous in God's eyes. There's a big debate as to whether this epistle was written by the Apostle Paul after his first uh, missionary journey or after his second missionary journey, it could have been written after his first missionary journey or toward the end of it to address this serious heresy before it was brought up with the Jerusalem Council. Or it could have been written after his secondary, second missionary journey to express his great disappointment for their continuing to permit a false gospel after he warned them about it during his second missionary journey with that letter from the Jerusalem Council. It's difficult to determine which, uh, which one it is. Either way, this was written before his incarceration, incarceration uh, which means that this is not one of his prison epistles. And it was probably written before any of his other epistles uh, that are preserved for us in the biblical canon. And there is also no clear indication of where Paul was or with whom he was when he wrote this epistle. But we see here Paul's reference to all the brethren that are with me. That implies here that the Galatians knew those with whom he was at the time, who were perhaps his companions and with whom he visited the Galatians before which is maybe explains why he doesn't 
uh, give any indication of who his companions are. <clears throat> Nonetheless, his epistle here to the Galatians was discussed with those with whom he was at the time, and his cares and his intentions were also shared with those with whom he was. And I believe that the Apostle Paul probably mentioned this, that those who were with him uh, agreed with him and, and he was with them to provide another reason for them to heed what he was writing to them, uh, that they had more reason to heed his epistle because there were other important Christians with whom he was serving who knew of their doctrinal position and who supported him in his stand against this false gospel that they were harboring. Next, I want to see my second point is apostles. I want to look at what apostles are. We see here in the first verse, Paul and apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead and all the brethren that are with me unto the churches of Galatia. We see here first, uh, he says that he's an apostle. An apostle was more than just a disciple, although the apostles were also called the 12 disciples. Put simply, an apostle is a delegate. It's a delegate, uh, like we understand the idea of a political delegate today. The word simply refers to someone who was commissioned and someone who was sent in order to represent that person by speaking on his behalf. And in order to biblically qualify as an official apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, a person must have lived during the ministry of Jesus. He must have been commissioned by Jesus to be an apostle, to be a sent one, to be a messenger. And he must have been a witness that he was resurrected. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse one, he says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? He has physically seen him on the road to Damascus. Uh, the office of apostle was never intended to be perpetual or to be succeeded after an apostle dies. Uh, I have to admit that an argument can be made that there were 13 apostles, but I won't get into that subject matter, whether it was Matthias or Paul that were the 12th or 13th apostles. But nonetheless, I believe that there are only 12 officially recognized apostles, as mentioned in Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, where it says, And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And so the whole point for ordaining apostles, the whole reason why our Lord chose out, ordained, and sent the 12 apostles was for them to be his contemporaries who outlived him, and to testify to others of his life, his death, and his resurrection, most importantly. And so although I don't know personally whether or not the Apostle Paul was an eyewitness of Jesus before he ascended to heaven, he was alive during our Lord's ministry, and he was a physical eyewitness of the Lord while he was in his resurrected body. And he was directly chosen by our Lord to be his apostle. So not only was he commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ, but he also points out here in verse one that he was also an apostle sent by God the Father. That the apostle Paul was called and sent by God the Father because the Father's will is always in unison with the Son and accomplished by the actions of the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ who was the one who appeared to and commissioned Paul. And so they were in unison in that decision. And so he was also sent by God the Father. And he also points out here that the Father raised the Lord Jesus Christ physically from the dead, which the Apostle Paul mentions, I believe, because it's the resurrection to which he was commissioned as an apostle to bear witness. And so he emphasizes that here the resurrection. It's very important that we always mention the resurrection. Whenever we uh, give glory to God, whenever we share the gospel uh, to glory in his resurrection. Brings me to my third point, that not just looking at the subject of apostles, but I want us to understand that apostles today are chosen by men. I want to look at the apostles 
that are chosen by men. That the Apostle Paul says here specifically that he was not an apostle chosen by men or sent by men. His being an apostle of Jesus and not of men refers to his being a messenger who came from Jesus himself. He was an apostle of Jesus. Also, his being an apostle by Jesus and not by men refers to as being sent directly by the Lord Jesus Christ and on behalf of him. The Apostle Paul wasn't chosen from among the apostles, by the apostles, and then uh, selected to uh, become an apostle and to be sent out by them. He wasn't sent by a man or even by the apostles. He was sent by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He chose him himself. It was him on the, that road to Damascus who met him, who called him and who sent him on his behalf as an apostle. And so today we see countless men and even women who are called apostles or who claim to have apostolic succession. But they are in truth apostles of men and by men, not of God and by God. Just like these false teachers from, uh, from whom the Apostle Paul was distinguishing himself in this epistle, every apostle today, whether Catholic or Pentecostal or, or Anglican or Lutheran or Mormon, all these different denominations and religions have apostles. All those apostles today are commissioned and appointed and sent by men. None of today's apostles are contemporaries of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord never physically appeared to any of them, especially among witnesses. And our Lord did not send them as his messengers to teach their false, unbiblical doctrines of men. Amen. And so these false teachers today claim to have titles like apostle so that they can usurp authority. They want authority over churches, or to become important, or to become influential. And many times, they want their money to take advantage of biblically ignorant Christians, or people that claim to be Christians, that are biblically ignorant. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he says, But there were false prophets also among the people, among the Israelites, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that, brought, that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now they're bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And then he says in verse 2, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Pernicious being destructive or that cause damage. Uh, their pernicious ways. They're bringing upon themselves God's destruction and they're leading others to that same destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. And that is the cause of many of these apostles and false teachers today. To make merchandise of those who profess to be Christians. And so there being false prophets and false teachers and false apostles is nothing new. Uh, there are many times, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, when God warned of men who would claim to be sent by him and to have biblical authority, but who were not given authority by him and were not sent by him. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 8 through 9, it says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you. Neither hearken to your dreams, which he caused to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. And then he says, I have not sent them, saith the Lord. They have their dreams. They have their visions. They claim to have seen Jesus. They claim to be sent by Jesus. They claim to be God's men, to be sent by God. And yet the Lord says he did not send them. These Galatians, though, personally met and knew the Apostle Paul. They witnessed firsthand his preaching and his godly lifestyle. 
However, because these false prophets, these false teachers were among them and challenging his office and his authority, the Apostle Paul didn't open this epistle with some warm sentiment or with happiness, with joy, if they're walking in the truth like he did for the Philippians. Instead, he opens this epistle right to business by establishing right up front in his first sentence, his commission and his authority. You have to have the right authority. And he differentiated himself here, not just from these false teachers among his contemporaries, but also from false teachers that we find today who claim to be apostles. That's right. So Paul, the apostle, introduced himself in this way so that these Galatians would consider that his epistle was written on the behalf of God, from God's officially sent messenger. And it's of utmost importance for them to heed his epistle. Amen. Great way to start an epistle when people are challenging uh, his office and authority. My last point, a shorter one, the intentions of Paul. We see his intentions here in verse 3. Great summary of his intentions here for the epistle. He says, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. They clarify it here that he didn't have ulterior motives for these Galatians. They didn't have selfish motives. But that he wrote this epistle, unlike these false teachers whom they were harboring in their midst, to desire grace for them and peace. His desire, first and foremost, was for the grace of God to be with them. Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, he says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. And we're going to explain that phrase when we come to it, when we study that verse, chapter 5, verse 4. But the, but the Apostle Paul's entire point of this epistle was for them to have God's grace, both individually and as a church. Unlike the Catholic cult teachers and the Protestant daughter churches, which Baptists are not Protestants, grace does not come by keeping the Mosaic law or by doing good works or by practicing man-made rituals. The purpose of this epistle is for the Apostle Paul to establish that grace is unmerited, God's unmerited favor, and that it's only received through faith, not through their works. He also states here his desire for their peace, for the peace of God to be with them. He, said, he mentions that also at the end of his epistle, Galatians chapter 6, verses 15 through 16, he says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, these rituals and these practices, your works, he says, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy. And so in order for these Galatians, as well as us, to have God's peace, they had to first be justified in God's eyes, reconciled with God and given peace with God through faith. And very important motivation here that the Apostle Paul has in verse 3. And so in closing, this epistle is instrumental for any person to understand the gospel, uh, through which he can acquire the grace of God, through which he can acquire the peace of God and peace with God. And so if any person questions whether or not he has genuine salvation from his sins, or he questions whether or not he has a genuine relationship with the Lord, studying this epistle should help that person to solidify his position before God and to gain assurance of salvation. Also, if any person feels like he's lacking God's grace in his life or in his heart, he feels like he is not at peace with God, or if he doesn't have the peace of God in his heart and mind, this epistle should also help that person to realize how he has possibly failed to realize how the grace of God operates in his life, which is the only source of God's peace. And this grace begins by God graciously showing a person the truth, by freeing him from the deception and the lies of this world and of these false teachers that are all around us. 
And it also begins by God graciously leading a person to listen to the right authority, Amen. which is the King James Bible. Amen. And it also includes those who preach the true gospel. That's defined in the word of God. That's defined here in the, the epistle to the Galatians. And to listen to those who teach the whole counsel of God. Those ought to be our authorities. So that was the lesson this afternoon, the right authority. Any comments or questions?